Welcome to Lawyers in the House with Motley. Wish you had a lawyer in the family? Now you do. Here's your host, Veronica Waters. Hey friends, welcome to Lawyers in the House with Motlick. I'm Veronica Waters, your host here on WSB, and we are so happy to have you here with us for another fantastic episode. You know what? Listen to me. I sound like I am pumping my own self up talking about another fantastic episode. I hope you think that they're fantastic because today I'm going to take us sort of on a little walk down memory lane to some of my five fave shows that we've had. We're going into season two here on Lawyers in the House with Montlick, and it's been an opportunity for me to learn so much about the law and to get to know some really incredible folks. But in that time, there are some moments that sort of stand out and some common themes that we encounter. And so kind of like Dave Letterman's top 10 list, I'm giving you a top five. Although, honestly, Is it too much to say these are like my kids and I couldn't pick a favorite? But we're going to have five favorites coming your way that will touch on so many areas of the law and so many things that affect so many of us day to day. Some advice for what to do when you or someone you love gets hurt and you need to know where to turn. One of my favorite episodes has to do with two of my favorite attorneys at Montlick, Ellen Forrester and Jennifer Fleming. We talked about liability waivers. And what are those, you might ask? Well, if you walked into a restaurant or a doctor's office, you went to a haunted house, you bought an amusement park ticket, you hopped on a zip line, you rented a tourist boat, and then you got hurt. Did you unknowingly sign away your rights? If something happened to you, sometimes you know that you're signing a waiver, but there are other times when they are practically invisible. And our liability waivers episode was so chock full of information. It's one I recommend that everybody listen to at least once just to make sure that you get it all. Attorneys Jennifer Fleming and Ellen Forrester apply this knowledge in their own lives and you're going to hear how. It's eye-opening stuff. All right, let's talk about, uh, oh, my God, death and dismemberment. Yeesh. Death and dismemberment? That, I, that's I, a I've lot. I've seen that for a flu vaccine in Come a waiver. Um, I had a friend who went to get a flu shot, and they gave him a waiver, and it said, I'm waiving my right to sue the doctors, even in the case of death and dismemberment. And you're going f- for a flu shot. You think, oh, that's so innocuous. Who does who, that? Right. I got but, a flu shot and didn't get, I hadn't. I didn't have to sign anything. Or, or, uh, did, or you? did you? Yeah, exactly. Uh, did you, did, but did seriously, you, did you check on a little like screen? Sign like, pad? Sign this. I was pad. at my doctor's office. Okay. Is that, would that maybe be different? It, it, it could be. And like okay, at a pharmacy, yeah. you know, you sign on that electronic pad. Yes. You sign, and you might be signing something you're not you're not aware of but but he didn't he told the doctor he didn't feel comfortable signing it but here's the option the doctor then made him leave so sometimes you're not really given much of a choice and it's either you sign it or you don't participate or you don't get the flu shot so it's just what you were saying earlier yes you just you you run the risk of not being able to do whatever it is you came to do. That's right, but you have to weigh the greater risk. Right. I hate to be a curmudgeon. There are a lot of things I do not let my kids do. And we get invitations to birthday parties at, you know, different adventure places, and I look at the invitation and I say to my husband, we're not going because I think that's too dangerous. Oh, well, what do you mean? I mean, of of course it's not. It can't be that dangerous. And I'm like, some activities are inherently dangerous. And so we just opt out of those. It's not about even the waiver. I make a decision before we even get that far, right? And so it, it's an interesting question about a flu shot, death and dismemberment. Eh, maybe not, but like horseback riding, um, you know, zip lining. What about a petting zoo or petting, a hay ride? Right, right. right. How, how dangerous is that? I mean, I think it depends. And and sometimes those have silent waivers, like the agritourism statute in Georgia, where if they posted, if there's something like a horse riding, horseback riding activity, if they have a sign posted at their main points of entry, 
you are deemed to have signed their waiver, acknowledging that if something happens to you, you cannot go after them. So just by walking in because they had a sign posted, like when we go out to dinner. Mm, Yes. Kind Uh, of. But it has to be a specific activity Mm -hmm. um, in the agritourism. Yeah, dinner's not agritourism. Right, right, right. right, Fair. (laughs) (laughs) True. Um, But but you're basically acknowledging that there that the activity is inherently dangerous, meaning horseback riding can be dangerous. Right. You could fall off the horse and get a concussion or something could happen to you. So. Yes, you need to be aware that that those things have silent waivers and you might walk right past that sign and not even see it. Not even think. So um, climbing on a horse then is considered me like the equivalent of a silent waiver. So I think I think that maybe not a silent waiver, but you've certainly assumed the risk. I took a call from a potential client who had gotten hurt on a horse a horseback riding. And this person said to me, well, you know, I, I signed this waiver or I didn't. It's not really the waiver is not the issue here. But I said to them, I said, well, you uh, horseback riding is dangerous. And so there's this assumption that when you get on a horse, you could get hurt. It's the same thing for things like trampoline parks. You go to a trampoline park. That's fun. Horseback riding is fun. It's supposed to be fun. There is a danger. Everybody know, or not everybody, but you should know, or you should at least stop and think: Could I get hurt doing this? Yes. Horses buck people off. Horses kick people. People break their ankles on on trampolines. Kids bump into each other. Very, very common for kids to bump into each other while jumping in bounce houses or trampolines and knock their heads together, stitches, I mean, head injuries, all of that sort of thing is dangerous. And we're not saying don't do any of this. You yourself have to determine for you whether it's worth the risk. And for someone, it might be worth the risk to go skydiving, but it's really dependent on each person. I really think it's important to bring up something that you said earlier in the show. We need to think about going ahead. I need to th- personally think about if I'm taking my grandnephew somewhere, um, am, is it okay for me to sign a waiver for for him going somewhere that is I think that's one of the things that's going to stick with me after this show is over Mm -hmm. just because somebody's in my custody can I sign a waiver for them Um, it's something that we need to think about you can take on your own risk but can you do it on behalf of somebody else such a fun show with Ellen and Jennifer thanks ladies for being in the house with me your girl Veronica Waters here on Lawyers in the House with Motlick on WSB mouse traps booby traps tourist traps those We know, right? But insurance company traps? Yeah, it's a real thing. They actually exist. And thanks to Motlick Injury Attorneys Jennifer Fleming and Nathan Kratzert, we got to examine some of them up close and personal. Like, did you know how a phone call could doom your case? Well, listen to this with Jennifer and Nathan talking about exactly that. Who wants to start us off? Tell me, like, what's one of the most common insurance company traps? You got the floor. I'll I'll start with one, um, a recorded statement. Everybody is, wait a minute. I'm on the, every time I call my cable company. That's right. It says, you know, this call may be recorded. Yep. Okay. So what's, what's the big deal with with it? So Mm. it sounds so innocuous. So anytime you call an insurance company, pretty much it says this call will be recorded for quality assurance, just like you said. So that, that in and of itself is not an actual recorded statement. That's just, you know, your conversation being recorded. A recorded statement is a formal statement that an insurance adjuster will say, do I have your permission to take a recorded statement? They ask that question, that way you know it's coming. Um, During that recorded statement, they can ask you all sorts of questions. And you may think to yourself, okay, of course they need the information so that we can get this settled or this claim moving or get my car repaired or a host of things that you would need done. The problem is that when you do that and you don't have representation, they are going to ask you all sorts of questions. And and that recorded statement can be used against you later on in a deposition, at trial, any other time they can use that statement. And it is a recording. So it's documented. So what are they asking me? Give me like what they may ask you how the accident happened. Uh, what the impact was like. Are you injured? Which is, is kind of a trap question also. So If you you call the insurance company and they want to take a recorded statement of you the day that you have an accident, you may not think you're injured at that point. You Mm -hmm. may still be in shock. Um, Sometimes injuries aren't felt for a day or two. Doctors say that all the time. I'm not a doctor, obviously, but just dealing with clients. Been there, girl. Yeah. Been there. You know, the next day you wake up and you feel worse than you do the first day because it's set in. So you might say, no, I'm not injured. And then 
later on your case goes to trial and the the attorney says to you, well, didn't you tell the insurance company the day of the accident that you weren't injured? And wouldn't it be in your memory best then? It's fresh. It's new. You would know. So are you lying today or were you lying then? And obviously you're not lying. It's how you felt at the time. But then later on, you were injured or you felt injured or you sustained injuries. So that those kind of questions are very tricky. You want to make sure you have representation if you're going to give a recorded statement. Every single case is different. There are certain times where taking a check early on is the right move. It's not usually, but sometimes it is. Other times, you know, it's very often I'll get phone calls and from potential clients and they'll say, I've got an offer. They sent me a check. I have this document to sign. What should I do? And then when I talk to them more in depth, I find out that they have a much more serious injury. Somebody might, I've had several times where people have had to have neck surgery, shoulder surgery, back surgery, and they, two months into the accident, were ready to take a check for five ten thousand wow. dollars And That's later that, gonna... that result was much different. The outcome was much different. And, you know, those are the cases where, you know, you get a hug from that client at the end. They're, they, they're so thankful. They say, thank you for not letting me do that. They don't realize at the outset, like, what the outcome is really going to be. We don't know. You don't know. I, I, I'm thinking that you've got this situation. Um, again, I just keep thinking about how scared I would probably be. And and let, let's be honest. I think we were talking to these insurance companies make me believe that they're on my side because we're. Ta- I, I need to ask you this. Are we talking about the other guy's insurance company or my insurance company? Because it's like I'm told that I've got a good neighbor or, right, you know, it's a cute little gecko or <laughs> exactly. I'm in good hands. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, the commercials make, you know, they make us feel warm and fuzzy when they watch the commercials on TV. They've got a lot of money. They spend a lot of money on advertising. They spend a lot of money on celebrities to advertise for them. And usually we're talking about both carriers, actually, because sometimes you have a situation where the other person's insurance company's uh, limits of their coverage, which is like the maximum amount that they will pay, is not enough. And it doesn't really cover what your injury is actually worth or what your medical bills are actually going to be so worth. So then my insurance company is going to step in and help. Potentially. Potentially, yes. When clients call me and they say, Nathan, I've been with this company. You know, they've been with me for uh, you know for my lifetime. Now my former agent's son is now my agent. And I tell them all the time and I say, what do you mean by that? What What is loyal? They, they've just done, but they've done right by me. I was like, what have they done for you? And they just, there's a long pause. And I say, <laughs> I mean, did they buy you, Rickets. did they buy you a birthday cake? <laughs> did they send you on a trip to Cabo? I mean, <laughs> or did they just take your money every month on the same day, every month? If so, I will be very loyal to you and I will take your money every <laughs> single month yeah. at the same time. Just yeah, give me your bank paycheck. account number. Okay. But, you know, and then they start to see, oh, they're really just making money. Yes, exactly. And that's your money. You paid. But then they're like, oh, they got me a new roof. That's cr- that's what they're supposed to do. Right. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the their job. job. <laughs> they, you, you paid for that coverage. You paid for them to make sure that if there's something happened that you were taken care of. Thanks to Nathan and Jen, whom I call the... Pitch Perfect Guy and the wannabe Broadway star. We have such a good time when we're in the house with those two. Great information. Now, sometimes I've learned the law can be very, very complex. And coming up on Lawyers in the House, we're going to talk about exactly one of those fields and two guys who have so much knowledge in it, that's what they work on 100% of the time. Don't miss it. Hey, friends, welcome back to the house. Lawyers in the house with Motlick on WSB. I'm Veronica Waters, and you are here with me as we do some of Veronica's faves. Five faves we're delving into on this episode. And thanks for hanging in here with me in our second season introduction to Lawyers in the House. Haven't you learned a lot over the past year? You know, the next show that we're going to talk about is one that, honestly, you know, we've had some occasional laughs on Lawyers in the House, even though we're talking about very serious subjects. But this was an episode that made me laugh out loud. And it had nothing to do with the actual topic, but because there's a segment in the show with me telling a story about a McDonald's roof caving in on me as a little girl. 
This was our workers' comp episode with Alex Tertichny and David Rubin, and we were talking about what actually happens if a roof caves in on you, because it could happen. Or one of the myriad ways you actually could get hurt on the job that's a lot more likely. What I did learn here is that workers' comp is such a complex area of personal injury law. And this episode really sort of peeled back the onion on just how much detail goes into that. And it lets me realize why having an attorney who really concentrates in this area, has expertise in this field, is so crucial when you want to get well and navigate the workers' comp system. Check this out. I think if there's one thing you could take away from this conversation is that (laughs) taking it back to workers' comp is that it's kind of a complex system. And for any given client of ours, it's probably their first workers' compensation case and they don't know the system. And it, we'd always recommend to call an attorney and speak um, to get a consultation. It's a free consultation. Actually, when you call us, typically you're on the phone with an attorney within 10 minutes. Um, It's not like we're going to call you later. We're not going to call you back tomorrow. We're going to talk that day and give you answers. And we can point you in the right direction. Should you, you know, what should you do? Should you get an attorney right away? Is it okay to wait? Is the employer doing the right thing? There's nothing for an attorney to do, but I'd much rather you call us too early and decide you don't need us than wait till it's too late. What's the, do the employers need to call you too? The employers are typically going to go through their own insurer okay. and their insurer probably has an obligation to provide them with counsel if it's necessary. Have you had a case, David, that sticks out in your mind when you think about all of the workers' comp cases that you've had? What, like one that sticks with you? A lot of cases boil down to is this injury, you know, employers may acknowledge that an accident happened on a job, but are the injuries related to this accident or were they pre-existing? And so a lot of times, like Alex and I will take on cases where we have to show that our client has a new definitive injury different from what may have been pre-existing before because you can have a pre-existing injury and qualify for workers' compensation. The question would become, do you have a new injury or an aggravation of an old injury? And so a lot of the cases that I think that, that, that satisfy me is, 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 is finding someone who may have had a prior problem but clearly has had an aggravation or even a new injury and, and help them fight Um, to get the benefits that they are entitled to. Thank you so much to David Rubin and Alex Tertichny for that spotlight on workers' comp. So many people have to encounter that in the course of their everyday lives. Don't you want lawyers who know what they're doing when they're helping you through that tough time? Coming up on Lawyers in the House, more of Veronica's five faves, including what happens when lawyers keep telling you, nope, can't help you. Stay with us. Hey, hey, you're in the house with me. Veronica Waters on Lawyers in the House with Motley here on WSB. Thanks so much for hanging in here with me. I'm so glad to have you as we go over some of my favorite episodes from season one of Lawyers in the House. Did you have a favorite? Let me know. Send me an email at lawyersinthehouse at motlick.com or tag me on social media in one of your favorite clips. I'd love to hear some of your favorite episodes. Always feel free to like and subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast podcast platform. I'm always open to hearing from you. You know, one of the episodes that impacted me so much is an episode that we touched on in insurance company traps, which was in our first half of the show. Bad faith insurance is what we were talking about. Whether you shake on it, pinky promise, or sign a contract, it's expected that your word is your bond. But what happens when you go back on your word and you break that contract? Or worse, when somebody does it to you? This episode of Lawyers in the House, Bad Faith, illustrated exactly how when a family is suffering and vulnerable and an insurance company, in essence, doesn't come through as that good neighbor or somebody who's got you in good hands as promised and expected, having a lawyer on your side from the start to set things up just the right way can make all all the difference. And we're talking about big bucks. The stories from Nate Kratzer and Bill Parker might make you drop your jaw at just how much. What is bad faith? Sure. I mean, in, in the when, we, when you hear the word bad faith in the context of insurance, uh, the concept generally is that an insurance company has um, the obligation to uh, <clears throat> investigate, evaluate, and timely pay valid claims. Um, and when you give, when an insured or a third party gives that insurance company 
uh, the opportunity to do that and they don't do the right thing uh, by timely paying the claim or, or unreasonably denying it or delaying the claim, then that is bad faith. Basically, when insurance companies misbehave, right? But it's not just a slap on the wrist that's at stake. There's the, there's a that they get. It's like a lot of money at stake. Um, the example uh, I can think of just off the top of my head is I had a family of um, five and the mother ended up passing away in the car accident. Uh, she left behind four children and her husband. And an insurance carrier could have settled that case for, I think, roughly $100,000 uh, because that was what the limit of coverage was. But because they failed to take the reasonable opportunity that we gave to them to settle that case, they ended up having to pay in the seven figures. And the important thing that, yeah, exactly. And the important thing to note is that that didn't bring back these children's mother. This didn't bring back this man's wife. Um, You know, the son's never going to get to dance with his mother at his wedding. The daughters are never going to get to, you know, do things with their mom that, you know, such as going dress shopping or anything like that. Um, It's over. And that money doesn't make up for it. But what it does do is that it does give people an opportunity to have something that's more in line with what the actual loss is. Every day, um, it just amazes me how insurance companies can mess this up when they help create the rules, right? And so I just had a case a couple of weeks ago that I settled that Nathan actually had worked on and we worked on it together. Uh, A lady uh, up in Gainesville who was T-boned by a 17-year-old girl and um, had a torn rotator cuff. And the uh, girl's family um, only had $25,000 worth of coverage on the vehicle. Uh, She had to have surgery on her shoulder. Uh, She had about $120,000 in bills. Uh, We sent a demand letter to pay the $25,000 policy limits, and the insurance company missed the deadline. Uh, And we ended up uh, settling that case a couple of weeks ago for $350,000. So they had to pay what's called extra contractual money, more money than that person paid for those low coverage. They paid three fifty dollars on a case that only had $25,000. So they could have stroked a check for twenty five k and been done done with it. Yeah. Um, but they but they missed that deadline. And another another uh, case uh, that's a, another tragic case that that is just it's just mind blowing to me that that why the insurance company would have done this. I, I represent a a man who lost his mother and his six year old son in a car wreck. Um, there were a total of four people who died in the wreck. There were three people injured in in the other uh, vehicle. The lady who was driving had twenty five thousand um, per person, fifty thousand dollars worth of insurance coverage. We sent a demand almost immediately to pay for the two wrongful deaths for the six-year-old kid and the and the mother, and the insurance company missed the deadline. Um, they ended up we ended up settling the the mother's case uh, for an, a substantial amount of money, um, and we the case with the six-year-old uh, child is still pending, um, and it's likely to settle for millions of dollars. When they could have settled those two cases for fifty thousand total, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing, so. and I I just wonder what is behind that. I know, like we've talked about the insurance carriers before, and it's a business, right? They're investing the money, they're making the money. That their job is to make money, but on some things, it seems like that would be insurance carrier adjuster class one hundred and one. No, brainer. don't miss a deadline. Sure. Don't nickel and dime. You know, I mean, to a point. To I mean, a, to a point, yeah, and but ultimately. I think that a lot of insurance carriers, they work on what the, it's a very hot buzzword word in the sports community. They work on these analytics and they know that so many people are not going to hire lawyers. Oh no. So many people are not going to really investigate what the insurance carrier tells them and they're going to accept and they listen to that phone call and they go through that script with that person that has made that claim and they're just going to accept that. I mean- that happens every single day, and we'll get phone calls and say, well, the insurance carrier said that I'll, I'll, I'll get this amount of money, and I said, okay, and I cashed that check. Is I that the end of the road? But I have to have surgery now. <gasps> and I, it's, it's a heartbreaking phone call because this is someone that you know you could have legitimately helped. Honestly, there were times in the studio you could hear a pin drop when Nate and Bill were talking about just how those cases affected so many families. 
Thanks so much to Nate and Bill for being in the house with us to talk about bad faith. Now imagine being hurt in an accident or a crash, no fault of your own. Imagine if it's an injury so bad that you can't work. You may not have a way to get around. Your medical bills keep piling up, and they're just beginning. The physical and the mental anguish you're probably experiencing through all that, no income, no clue when you're going to be able to work again, if ever. And then imagine that through all of that, an insurance company or even a law firm tells you, sorry, can't help you. This was one of the most emotional episodes of Lawyers in the House with Motlick. It starred Nevis Urich and Mike Moran, and it was story after story of how not just a lawyer, but the right lawyer can help change your life for the better. Time after time, Nevis and Mike are the attorneys who, when somebody made even sometimes more than one call to an insurance company or a law firm, somebody told them, no, no, we can't help you. And Motley listened to their stories and said, yes, we can help you. And these clients got not only a yes, but they got huge results huge results to help ease their transitions back into being whole. Talk about going the extra mile. Listen in. That's got to be like an extra challenge. Yeah, I had a client who called me and um, it was the perfect storm. It was uh, he was hit on the back of his vehicle by a a girl who left the big box store and she failed to yield. And there was very, very minor property damage, so much so that they decided that they wouldn't even call the police. So there wasn't even a police report. They just exchanged information. Now, he had Uh, back surgery about four months prior to this wreck. Um, They exchanged information and didn't think anything of it. Uh, He went home, sat in a chair, and almost immediately realized uh, something was wrong. And so um, it was a perfect storm because it was very little property damage. There was no police report that that recreated how it happened. Um, And so I I, I took his case. I believed him. I knew he was hurt. I talked with him. He was credible to the bone. Um, I met him at the scene. We had to take photographs. We had to recreate how it happened. And we still got no's. No, no, no from the insurance company. This could not have caused the injury. Ultimately, um, his surgery failed and because of this, and he had to have a revision done. Um, So he suffered for a long time. and, And we after repeated no's had to put this into a lawsuit. And the, the biggest thing was I knew he was credible. We had to get him in front of people and he had to tell his story and he gave his deposition and, and he did, and he was uh, believable and the defense counsel believed them. And um, after a long fight, we resolved that case for $350,000. And so it went from a zero and a fat no entirely from the beginning to uh, a recovery for him. And and it was because his condition worsened. Even though there was no police report, there was very little property damage. Um, I knew it happened. He knew it happened. And at the end of the day, we were able to prove that. How must that feel? Not just for you, the attorney who helps guide this victory, but for the person who has already been told no, 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 no. I said no. They don't understand. They, they don't understand that. I'm sure Nevis has had clients like that as well. It's hard, it's hard for them to understand that. Once we win for these clients, um, it is so gratifying to know that people who felt helpless and hopeless, whose families sometimes met with us and told us how their life has been turned upside down, uh, people are losing jobs. They have to have surgeries. They have families to support. Um, the pain in their voices, sometimes it's just too much to bear. Um, So winning for these people uh, whose pleas for help were uh, ignored by either insurance companies who deny their claims or attorneys who had spoken with them before but didn't believe in the merits of the case, it is an unbelievable feeling of vindication. And um, those are the most rewarding uh, moments for me personally. I'm sure Mike can attest to that, to know that we've overcome a challenge that some people just thought was too much to tackle. There was a case that I handled uh, for a young man who was a father of three, a uh, very hardworking man, uh, was walking to his employer's, uh, to his employer in the morning time. Mm-hmm. Um, it was nighttime. He was wearing dark clothing. Uh, the street that he was crossing did not have a walkway. Um, and a big commercial tractor trailer uh, made a wide turn and did not notice that he was there and struck him. The officer who came to the scene 
uh, put my client at fault. Um, they made every excuse under the sun for why the tractor trailer driver could not see him. They blamed it on the lighting. They blamed it on the pedestrian lack of pedestrian walkway. They blamed it on the shrubbery that was allegedly overgrown that would um, not give uh, a clear view of where he was driving. My client was hurt, understandably. Yeah, so, he hit by a big rig? Yeah, oh and he called me. He was desperate. Um, he needed help. I met with his family. He had a few small children. He couldn't go to work. And after going to the scene, um, taking pictures of the alleged overgrown shrubbery, uh, examining the lighting, um, getting open records request, hearing other statements, and then, boom, the smoking gun, a video from a nearby business that captured the collision. Um, we would have never gotten to that point had we not done our research and investigated and pushed hard. And it is the video from a nearby business that captured the crash, essentially, of this tractor trailer hitting my client is what helped overturn the liability. But what was it about the video? Because there was no argument that your client got hit by the truck. Sure. Yeah. Um, the uh, footage revealed that the tractor trailer was driving pretty fast, took a very wide turn, was in the lane of passage uh, that he wasn't supposed to be in, and that uh, at the time of striking my client, his vehicle was straight. He had a clear, unobstructed view that his headlights would have captured. Um, and it took a lot of hard work, a lot of fighting with the firm that was hired by the trucking company, but they came to their senses and had it not been for the tape and the images that we took of the scene a day after it happened, I don't know that we would have been able to win for this man and, and helped him get his life back on track. Nevis Yurich and Mike Moran really making a difference for folks who thought they had nowhere else to turn. Thanks so much for sharing those stories, Nevis and Mike. Coming up on Lawyers in the House with Motley, normally around this time, I would say the MCA is on the way, the Motley closing argument. But am I going to be the one making a closing argument this time? Stay with us and find out. Welcome back to Lawyers in the House with Motlick on WSB. I'm Veronica Waters, and you are listening in with me to Veronica's Five Faves, some of the highlights from season one of Lawyers in the House. And like every good clips show, who would we be if we didn't give you at least a couple of bloopers to show what it's like behind the scenes along the way? Check these out. I'm your host, Veronica Waters, with two incredible Motlick injury attorneys, Lynn Walker and Doug Glossman, two um, competitive... Huh? Glosser. Glosser. What did I say, Glossman? What yep. the frick is wrong with me today? <laughs> Glassman, Lynn Glassman. Glasser, Glossman, whatever. Welcome back to the house, lawyers in the house with Doug... <laughs> here with Doug Glossman and Lynn Walker talking about... did it again. Oh, Oops. Put that one on. Glosser! His first name is Doug. I know that much. Okay. <laughs> Veronica, my check-in, my check-in, yeah, yeah, Longoria. Why's it gotta always be Mike? What about Steve or David or Why Peter? Don't we have Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a Michael check, check, check. Ah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those always give me the giggles. I love doing this show. It has really opened up my eyes to so many aspects of the law and so many even aspects of radio. I'm doing things that I've never done before, thanks to lawyers in the house with Motlick. You know, I have covered courts for a very long time. And one of the things that is very typical, as you know from watching TV and the movies, this is actually accurate, people put their hand on something and they swear an oath that they're going to tell the truth. Well, I have a confession to make here. When I was asked to come up with my top five Lawyers in the House episodes, I couldn't do it. I had so many moments that I loved about this show. I've learned so much. I've had such incredible guests. And not just the attorneys um, who you, whom you didn't get to hear or see on this show. You know, what about Mark Molina? How about Alyssa White, Jason Saltzman, Alan Saltzman, Sarah Root, Michelle Mumpower, Richard Warner, Lynn Walker? I've learned so much and gotten to know the hearts and minds of the folks at Montlake and learned that these are real crusaders who never 
ever will turn their backs on you if there is any hope of helping you. Not all superheroes wear capes. I've learned a lot. I've seen a lot. It's really been eye-opening, and I hope that you've enjoyed this journey with us on Lawyers in the House with Montlake on WSB. I am Veronica Waters. See you in Season 2.